test
My audio is not working. And my video is not working. Help me, help me. Uh, First of all, my settings. All right. Madam Speaker, can you hear me? Let's, let's try this again. All right. You can hear me? Great, okay, excellent. I don't hear anybody else, but we're just gonna hope uh, that uh, we, are, we are live and good to go. I think we are up and streaming. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope that everyone has had a uh, productive and safe and healthy week. Um, we are uh, we are live streaming this this work group today, um, and so it is live on the um, uh, on a YouTube channel. This morning we had some technical difficulties mm -hmm. where we had to switch the 
we had to switch the, uh, the, the feed and the stream, but hopefully uh, if you go to the Maryland General Assembly website, uh, the, the link is now live and available. Um, if you open up the link, notice that there is the, um, the, the presentation is the main um, the main screen, and then whoever the the speaker is at the time will be sort of videoed in the top right corner. So, uh, just know that uh, when you're asking questions, uh, that your screen will will likely come up on the feed um, during the uh, during the presentation. So, um, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and jump right into things. Um, Jake, if you could flip to the next slide. So we have a, a, a packed panel today. Um, we just have a couple intro notes. Uh, we have the secretary joining us. Um, we have some public health experts who will hopefully provide us some really interesting information uh, about the status of things at the moment uh, to kind of world, globally leading uh, health uh, public health officials. Um, and then we will have Superintendent Karen Salmon joining us. And then we'll do some cl closing remarks and sort of hear from from members uh, on on where things stand. So uh, final or next slide, Jake. So the, again, this is just a reminder that the meeting is being live streamed on the General Assembly's uh, YouTube channel. Um, the very briefly, the things that we've seen, and it's kind of amazing each day sort of feels like a year uh, at this point, but um, in the last week, we've seen three separate executive orders or, or revisions to existing executive orders. We have uh, the, uh, the one on April 3rd, which was the prohibitions on foreclosures, resi residential and commercial evictions, and repossessions. Um, this is for the, the duration of the, uh, the public health emergency. Uh, and so I think that put a few people's minds at ease uh, for at least the short term. Uh, April 5th, we saw a delegation of authority uh, to the Secretary of Health uh, around nursing homes and the expanded use of county health officers for the authority around nursing homes. That was then enhanced on April 7th with the most, most recent, that was yesterday's executive order, which created um, these new strike teams uh, for nursing homes uh, to, obviously we've seen some pretty tragic outbreaks at some of the nursing homes across the state. Um, and uh, the governor's, uh, the administration's moved forward to really kind of build some supports around, around the nursing home uh, the impact of the epidemic on nursing homes and the new authority for local health departments to shut down businesses. Um, so those are sort of the big things that have happened. The other note uh, that, that members may be interested in is that all of the bills, all of the outstanding bills that passed both chambers, uh, yesterday was the 20th day since Sine died. So all of them have now been presented to the governor. The governor now has 30 days uh, in which to decide whether to sign, uh, to let go into law without signature or to veto. Uh, and so we will certainly keep um, folks updated if we know any more. With that, I'll hand it over to Speaker Jones. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Um, last Friday, uh, we had the um, we had a bill signing. I think the third bill signing we have had since uh, session. Um, there were two bills that. Uh, dealt with health, um, telehealth. We had a crossfire bill that allows healthcare practitioners to establish a, a practitioner patient relationship through telehealth. And the, the other bill allowed um, medical assistance um, practitioners to provide mental health services, again, in, in the patient's home through telehealth. Um, at that, bill signing, I had mentioned to the governor um, that we had um, requests from our members, um, Delegate Nick Mosby in particular, about the uh, getting the data for um, uh, racial, racial data and other ethnic groups. And at that time, he said he would be looking at the uh, lab. And I think, uh, by the fact that it's been more visible across the country and some of the other states, um, although the, in particular the African American community, the numbers weren't um, high, but the incidence of 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 COVID nineteen was extremely high, and I think that um, got the governor when he did his press conference yesterday to reference that they would uh, be. Uh, st 
stepping it up, uh, getting uh, the, the appropriate data. Uh, they will lose some because some of the uh, doctors send their out, out of state labs by going forward uh, to be able to get, get us some numbers. So I want to thank Nick Mosby for really spearheading that and others who had um, also were um, asking for that. Okay. Um, is Secretary Neal here now? It's Secretary in the we, we don't currently have the Secretary on yet. No. Okay, 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 okay. All right, so. But we can move on to the next panel. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Do we wanna go, to, do we wanna to jump to, um, do we wanna to jump to Dr. Sharfstein or do we wanna see, uh, and. Dr. Dr. Inglesby, and then have the secretary come in after that presentation. Yeah, they're here. You know, they're are they on? Great. They're on now. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and jump there. They should be on. Hi there. Yeah. Excellent. There's Dr. Inglesby and Dr. Sharfstein. I see you there. Uh, Jake, could you uh, move the presentation forward? Yep. Excellent. Uh, so just want to welcome uh, Dr. Thomas Inglesby and, and Dr. Joshua Sarfstein, um, both from the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And uh, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Okay. Uh, would you like me to start, Josh, or? or... Yes. Yes, okay. I think so. Excellent. Okay. President Ferguson, Speaker Jones, members of the General Assembly, it's, it's great to be with you today. Thanks so much for the invitation. I have uh, comments on the measures that have been taken in Maryland and the overall trajectory of COVID in the state and what I think needs to happen to get to the point of easing social distancing and moving closer towards normal in the time ahead. First, some words on what we've learned about COVID so far. It appears the virus has something on the order of a one to 2% case fatality rate for recognized diagnosed cases. It's clear that there are many cases that are not being formally diagnosed because we don't have diagnostic testing for mild cases at this point. So the real case fatality rate will be lower, but for the cases that are actually diagnosed, that's the number for the country so far, and that's been the number for many countries. In mild cases, the virus causes a flu-like illness, sometimes only fever or headache or fatigue. But in severe cases, it has been causing respiratory failure, intubation, and death. US data shows so far that the fatality rate in recognized cases is highest in persons over age 85, ranging from about 10 to 25% of those cases, followed by 3 to 11% among persons who are age 65 to 84 and one to 3% among persons aged 55 to 64, with less than 1% mortality occurring in persons aged 20 to 54. So far, about 1.7% of the cases in the country have been children, and 5% of those cases have required hospitalization, with three deaths so far in children. So obviously far less serious than adults, but not completely benign. Persons with underlying health conditions such as diabetes, chronic lung disease, and cardiovascular disease appear to be at the highest risk for severe COVID outcomes. We've also seen that COVID virus has the ability to spread rapidly and widely in society and around Maryland. Without social distancing measures, on average, one person with this virus could infect as many as two or three more. Some reports in other parts of the world say that the virus without social distancing has infected as many as one to five people. And then those people who are infected in turn can infect two to three more, more, more and so on with new generations of cases every five to seven days. So this is what people refer to as exponential spread of the virus in the absence of social distancing measures. So without a vaccine or a therapy to slow the disease down, the only way to slow this down has been social distancing measures for a period of time which is why I think it's been so important that the, the, those measures have been in place in Maryland in the last almost four weeks. If the virus were left to spread without social distancing, then the number of sick people, especially critically ill, could overwhelm our health system, which has been seen in China 
and in Italy and in Spain and France, among other places, and will probably begin to happen in other parts of the world as the disease accelerates in uh, parts of the world that are less developed, which haven't had as much diagnostic testing capacity. On the other hand, we've seen in places like Singapore and Taiwan and South Korea, which have used social distancing measures and really societal engagement on a large scale, they have gotten their, their outbreaks under far better control. They still have to deal with the disease day in, day out, but they're able to manage it and their society is functioning at a better, kind of a more normal, somewhat more normal level than ours is. If our health systems in Maryland became overwhelmed by this, by, by far too many patients, then the mortality that we talked about before of one to 2% would go up because we wouldn't be able to intubate everybody or provide ventilators for everybody who needed one. And it's also possible as we saw in Italy and in China that hospitals could become so, so burdened that they would have difficulty providing regular medical care that we need for our many other medical problems that present to hospitals every day. So just switching to the national level for a moment, nationally yesterday we had 1800 fatalities from coronavirus. In Maryland, as of last night, we have a total of 4,371 cases with 27,000 negative test results so far, 100 deaths, 103 deaths, and 1,106 hospitalizations spread across the state. In hospitals across the state, there are many people intubated at this point. There has not been a situation that I'm aware of, that I've heard about, where someone could not get a ventilator that needed one. And we're hoping that the social distancing measures that have been put in place will prevent that. But it's certainly possible that that could happen in the time ahead. Uh, I heard yesterday that in Anne Arundel Medical Center, for example, there are something in the order of 100 intubated patients, and they're making plans to prepare for hundreds more if needed. I'm not sure about those numbers. That's what I heard. I, was, I, I wrote them down, but I'm not positive of those specific numbers. I do know that at Johns Hopkins Hospital, there are more than 100 inpatients hospitalized with COVID at this point. There still continue to be serious shortages of diagnostics in our state and in basically every state especially the rapid diagnostics where you can get the results the same hour or the same day. There are, there's more capacity to send diagnostics out of state or to, to the large laboratories like Quest and LabCorp, but those can take sometimes three, five, seven days to get back. And so patients, you know, you need to, it's very helpful to know from a public health and medical standpoint much sooner how to treat patients. There are also shortages of, of masks still that are pretty serious in the state and the state is still working hard to get more personal protective equipment. The counties with the greatest number of cases so far are Prince George's, Montgomery, Baltimore, Baltimore City and Anne Arundel, although there are smaller numbers of cases in, I think in all counties at this point. There are 90 long-term care facilities and nursing homes with at least one or more cases of COVID. Some of those are have only a single case. Some of them have had larger outbreaks and the Maryland Health Department have sent out teams to the ones that they've deemed to be the most serious outbreaks or the ones that have had the most trouble with management of those outbreaks. And they're trying to help them improve infection control, although I think they don't have the equipment they need at this point. There's a very impressive, in my view, 250 bed facility being set, stood up in the Baltimore Convention Center that has been set up by the state, I think with the assistance of the National Guard and which will be staffed, I believe by Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland clinicians. I, I went through it yesterday and, and was really impressed by the professionalism of the people working there uh, and the way that they're, they have individual um, places for beds. It's, it's not intended to be for very sick people. It's intended to, to be a facility that would care for people who recovered and were down to being able to be cared for as kind of a low acuity hospital patient. They have the capacity for oxygen there, for example, and IV fluids, but, but other than that, they wouldn't have a lot of the things that we would have in a normal hospital. In the last few days, the White House has declared the Washington Baltimore corridor a hotspot, which has allowed more resources to be sent to the state and specific more ventilators. 
This is something that Governor Hogan really was arguing for strongly. I understand with the vice president and president, because I think he, he determined that that would allow the state to get more resources. And because he was watching the numbers go out, go up in a number of counties and in Washington and Northern Virginia. So he wanted the area to be designated a hotspot. On a, just to compare how we're doing to other parts of the country, on a per capita basis in Maryland, we've had two deaths per 100,000 people. New York has had 28 deaths per 100,000 people, the, the state, and the city is higher. Uh, New Jersey as a state has 14 deaths per 100,000, but very concentrated in the North, it would be much higher. And Washington state, which was the first big state, has had five deaths per 100,000 people. So I think we're, we're somewhere in the middle. Um, and in terms of international comparisons, China has had less than one death per 100,000 overall. The US is four deaths per 100,000. And Italy has had 28 and Spain 30 deaths per 100,000 people. Some good news is that yesterday in Maryland, we were down to 326 new cases from the day before, which was 436. I haven't heard today's numbers, but if those numbers were a real trend, that would be very good news for Maryland. Obviously, one day is not a trend. We need to see many days of reductions in cases to believe anything. Um, but the hospitalizations were also down yesterday from more than 100 the day before to 40. We don't know when our peak will come um, in Maryland. In other countries, the peak epidemic day has come somewhere in the order of three, four, five weeks after the imposition of large scale social distancing measures. So it's at least conceivable that some of the things that were started about a month ago or four weeks ago are beginning to have an impact on our overall curve. I do think the numbers are far less than they would be given the exponential growth that occurs without social distancing. One model that the White House is using for the country and for each of the 50 states has our peak in Maryland occurring about April 18th, but uh, that model doesn't really account for the differences that states have taken in terms of social distancing. And I think Maryland has been more, has been earlier and more aggressive. So my hope is that maybe our peak might come sooner. But again, we, it could, other models show it coming much later, either later April or later May. And there's so much uncertainty that I think we just have to follow the numbers. We do see in other places in the world that um, there is a coming down in some places. In China, certainly they've come down from having a complete crisis early on in January and February to the point now where in Wuhan, a city of about 11 million in the middle of China, they are beginning to tentatively reopen that city, allowing travel restrictions to be relaxed. Transportation is beginning to run again, still with many things in place, but the beginning to lessen it. In Washington state, where they also were an early starter in the United States, the numbers of new cases seems to be leveling off over the last few days. It's still too early to say it's a consistent trend, but also something somewhat positive. New York and California also seem to have a, at least a plateauing of their cases, which could be a sign that what they're doing is working collectively to at least stop the, the growth in the daily counts. And at, as the states um, are, are working to bring these numbers down, I think uh, we should start, we, we are, people are starting around the country to begin to think about how to reduce social distancing measures. What is the order of operations? What are the triggers for reducing those things? In general, the, the conditions that I think should be in place in Maryland before we really start reducing social distancing are wide, widespread abundance of testing, which need to be available for people even with mild cases. We need to know how much disease we have in the state with some reliability before we start allowing things to start moving towards normal. We also have to have masks and gowns and gloves for our healthcare workers because they were, they're in a very bad, they've been in a very bad position putting themselves at risk without the right equipment and that needs to be restored and people are working on that. And we need to have a, a true downturn in numbers to get to the point where there are manageable small numbers of cases. And 
we also need to have our public health system in Maryland ready to track those people. So if we have, if we can drive it down to 10 or 20 cases or 30 cases, whatever the number is that we decide, we need to have those people identified, isolated at home. If they can't isolate at home, isolated safely somewhere else in a hotel for the duration of their illness. And we need to be able to trace all of their contacts. That is not something that most cities or states can do reliably right now, but people like Josh, who you're about to hear from, have been working very hard in Maryland to try and get that capacity built. And I do know that the state is very eager to do that. The city, I know with Josh's leadership, is eager to do that, Baltimore City. Um, but we do need to get that into place. Dr. So that, I think I'll stop. And, Perfect. Um, Thank you so much. And first, and I forgot to, in the introduction, forgot to thank you for, for your advice and help and guidance uh, when we were in session. Uh, your thoughts and uh, were incredibly helpful uh, in, as we were trying to make the tough decision about how best to handle sessions. So thank you for that. Um, I know there are going to be a couple of questions. So members, if there are questions, if you just hit the, the raise hand button, um, but uh, Dr. Sharfstein, uh, we'll have him go ahead. But if members have questions, just hit their, the hand raise button and we'll, we'll get it at the end if we have some time. We have to unmute Dr. Sharfstein, I believe. All right. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Ferguson, Speaker Jones, um, and all of you for uh, having us. Um, I thought uh, Tom did a terrific job summarizing the situation, so I'm not going to go over any of the things he did and just talk about three things very briefly so we have plenty of time for discussion. Um, next slide. I'm going to talk about uh, very briefly communication, then partnerships, and then thinking about the economic and disease control strategy together, building on something that Tom said. Next slide. So this is just a general point. In a crisis like this, when we talk about communications, communications is more than just telling people what's going on. Communication is actually a critical part of the response. And I think one of the reasons Marilyn is doing relatively well, as Tom said, is that the communication has been very clear, not just from the governor, who's been very clear, and not just from Fran Phillips, but from all of you, who in many different ways have been um, supporting a very uh, strong response uh, very early on. And I think that really has to continue um, as we kind of maneuver our way through, that the more people hear from different sources, the same information about what they can do to protect themselves, then the more they will do the things they need to protect themselves. And that's what really accounts for um, the, the, the fact that things are slowing a little bit. It's not just that the governor imposed social distancing, but that people are following them. And that really is about communication. These are the six principles of good communication in a crisis from the CDC. Um, timely, accurate. By accurate, it's very important not to overly reassure. You know, um, we don't want people to feel helpless or hopeless, but we want them to know the facts. Credible, and I think the way that um, you all relied on uh, experts and um, people in the health system to amplify messages is very important. Obviously, empathy, promoting what people can do themselves, and um, showing respect for um, all the different communities in Maryland, making sure that um, messages are getting out everywhere is very important. Next slide. I just want to mention this point, which is um, the scale of this challenge is really um, unlike any public health challenge any of us have faced. And that means that the resources that have to be brought to bear go well beyond uh, what even the government can traditionally offer. Um, no public health agency has the ability to do the kind of things that Tom was talking about needs to be done all by itself. And so um, I think it, particularly for you all as leaders of the state, it's important for you to be thinking, how can we reach out beyond government to other sources of resources and power and connection to really um, you know, put our state in the best position? And here are just some ideas. You know, it's, it's one thing for people to do press conferences and release press releases. That's important, that's necessary. But we also wanna make sure that the TV stations you all work on are, are um, putting up the right messages. Uh, radio is broadcasting things. The faith community really understands the information and community groups that you all work with, you all may know better than anyone else. Are they getting what they need, the information that they need? Because people have to hear about it from every channel, not just the government channel. Um, nursing homes, Tom mentioned, 90 uh, places with cases, multiple outbreaks. 
Again, um, there is an enormous role for the strong government response that we're seeing, but there may be opportunities for others to help support nursing homes. I could imagine that in communities, um, groups will sponsor nursing homes to raise funds for them, to sew masks for them if they need to, to perhaps um, uh, do some uh, non-patient care related functions to make it easier for them. But we have to be thinking outside the box about how we can take other resources and support institutions, not just like nursing homes, but assisted living, senior housing, um, other institutions that are very high risk for being sources of outbreaks. Um, call centers, contact tracing, other elements of the public health response. There are not enough people in the health departments to do this. So how we find people, it's gonna be outside of government and you all may know who are the institutions in your area or in the state that could be mobilized. I know as Tom mentioned, the School of Public Health, we've been working with both the state and the city to develop um, ways to bring in a lot of other people to help with these aspects of public health. Um, and then social support, uh, isolation locations, obviously the convention center is terrific, but we're gonna need more space than that, particularly for people who are quarantining, can't quarantine safely at home. We have to think about partnerships with dorms and hotels and other places over time. The more we can build that public health response through bringing in partners like this, the more success we'll have at being able to open up um, the economy again. And here's the last slide, which is just to point out that um, a model for thinking about what needs to happen is an adaptive response that we're, we're there as the curve is going up. Maybe now we're a little bit over, but what we're gonna do, we, we've tightened up very, very quickly and that's blunting the peak. And then eventually we're gonna be seeing a decline in cases and we're gonna loosen things, but it's not done and done at that point. We have to think about turning this on as not an on and off switch, but more, uh, someone else had this metaphor, more of a dimmer switch. We're gonna turn the lights back on a little bit we're gonna be watching through that surveillance Tom talked about the testing to see whether cases are bumping up too quickly and then we may turn it down a little bit. And so you see this, this shows that if you start to see cases going up, then suddenly we may say, actually, you know, we're gonna close school for another couple of weeks or we're gonna, um, you know, uh, say that certain businesses have to close. And then when things are calm again, we'll open up again. That's what's happening in Singapore. Singapore is doing as a tremendous public health response but when they see too much community transmission, they dial back, they, they dial up their social distancing to, to repress the infections. And this is what you know we're gonna be doing over time. The stronger public health response that we have, the, the easier this is gonna be. Um, and the, the lighter the room is gonna be with our dimmer switch. And the last concept I'll just say is that as we think about economic recovery, I think for the most part, we've thought about it as we need to get our economy, you know, hold it in, in treading water mode, keep people employed until the light goes on and we can just bring, bring it all back. And to a certain extent, that's absolutely true. But if we can think about the economic investments we're making, if we invest in things that will control the disease, then that's gonna make it easier for us to reopen. So if we can align economic investments, if we can do jobs programs to help with contact tracing, or if we can find ways for hotels, not just to pay their employees, but to actually house healthcare workers or house people in quarantine, then it does double duty. It give, keep, puts money in people's pockets and it puts us in a better position to be able to do the loosening and let the rest of the economy open up again. So I'll, I'll stop there, Senator. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Sharston, we also, we have one question, I don't think, is Secretary Neal on yet? Um, I'm here. Oh, okay. Well, we, uh, I guess after you, we do have some um, questions for our members, but we'll um, take this, the Secretary, so perhaps you can go right ahead. And welcome, Secretary Neal. Thank you. Um, I want to start out. I want to. I want to thank Dr. Sharfstein for his learned comments. Uh, there's. There's. There's a. There's a lot of um, food for thought there. Um, just. Just um, in broad strokes, 92% uh, of our cases are in the Baltimore-Washington corridor. 25% um, uh, of our cases end up going to the hospital. Um, uh, Eighty percent of our deaths are people older than 60. And, um, 
As far as testing is concerned, we have five um, VEEP sites up and operating, and there are six or maybe even more independent sites. So since the last time we talked, um, testing has, um, has uh, uh, moved ahead. Not nearly as much testing as we need to do, but at least it's moving in the right direction. Uh, you should um, uh, feel pretty good this morning that we have 1,178 ventilators statewide that are available for use, and we have ordered more. In fact, I've ordered uh, a little bit more than twice that, so that we have uh, enough. Um, protective equipment is starting to come in. We're doing procurements of our own, and we're also um, um, drawing down from the federal um, uh, inventory. Um, our response, and um, uh, I'm not trying to be cute, but it's basically nouns, persons, places, and things. The persons, we're recruiting as many people as possible into the Medical Reserve Corps. We're probably going to have um, uh, physicians graduate early, as well as uh, nurses. And the ones that are, are not uh, within range of graduating are probably going to be pressed into service under the supervision of licensed personnel. Um, we're getting as many volunteers as we can. I think the last time I looked, we had 6,000 in the Medical Reserve Corps, uh, and we're, and we're uh, recruiting uh, uh, volunteers uh, to, to serve in all sorts of roles. That's the person's places. We're trying to get as many alternative care sites up as possible. Just to give you an idea of the size and scope of this, uh, we're trying to stand up um, uh, a temporary system that's two-thirds the size of our existing system. And, um, and we also, um, uh, to uh, Dr. Sharfstein's um, point, uh, we're contracting with ho uh, hotels and um, we're probably going to use some college dorms and other things to be able to, to um, um, uh, accommodate people. Uh, the things are ventilators, uh, personal protective equipment, lab test chemicals, drugs. Yesterday, for instance, we got some feedback from hospitals that the drugs that are used to um, uh, intubate people, the, the, the sedatives and whatnot, uh, are in short supply. So we're jumping on that to see if we can't find substitute um, drugs and then also to uh, hit the supply chain and get adequate quantities of that. Um, the um, uh, while we're continuing to acquire um, personal protective equipment and ventilators through federal requests, but we have lots of purchase orders on our own that belong to us that are in, in the stages of being delivered. We're focusing on nursing homes per the governor's executive order on Sunday. We've set up strike teams to assist and support nursing homes, um, as announced by the governor yesterday, uh, and we're distributing the state's stockpiles to local jurisdictions. Now, I have a series of questions, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, I can uh, uh, deal with them now or um, deal with them uh, at, the, at the end, but uh, I have, I have uh, uh, responses for uh, each of the questions that you sent me in advance. It's your pleasure. Okay. We, um, how, how long is, are the responses? Because we have members also have questions there as well would it, would it be would it be all right if we sent the answers to everyone yeah. in writing and then that would yeah. save more time for the yes. meeting yes no okay be. then that's what we'll do okay mr president are you okay with that that's great okay okay all righty um for our, we are now going to go to questions but i am because i've been uh emailed and asked about this. Um, the state facilities, I know when um, uh, President Ferguson and I, last time we were at the state house, we had to get a temperature check when we did the come for the bill signing. Are all state facilities, um, those who enter required to have temperature checks? I can't tell you for sure. I think many of them are, but I'm going to get an emphatic answer for you and get back to you. I will tell you that now that uh, the um, personal protective equipment has um, has loosened up a bit, we're getting we're getting um, um, 
uh, adequate amounts of that out to all of our state facilities to protect um, to, to protect the workers. But I'll, I will I will get back on, on the temperature checks. Oh, okay, and I want to call on Delegate Jackson. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Madam Speaker and uh, Mr. President. And uh, it's great to see our um, friends from uh, the School of Public Health. Um, and I think Secretary Neal may have answered it. Uh, the Baltimore Convention Center, um, the 250 bed site for recovery uh, to help sustain uh, the recovery for, for patients. Um, my question, prior to Secretary Neal coming on, uh, dealt with um, what other sites? There's 250 beds in the city, um, but if we have uh, the numbers that we have across the state, um, what processes were set up for uh, recovery uh, before uh, the patients were um, released? Well, the, the 250 bed field hospital at the, at the convention center is going to be run jointly by the University of Maryland Medical System and the Johns Hopkins uh, Medicine. That is to provide um, um, step down, not just for their hospitals, but also the rest of the Baltimore hospitals to ease um, uh, overcrowding. Uh, we have um, 11, uh, 100 uh, modular facilities um, uh, amounting to about 1,000 beds that we are working with hospitals to locate to add on-site surge space. And I, I know that there are going to be a number of those placed uh, in the Baltimore metropolitan area. So uh, we're working closely with hospitals because they know their capacities best and they know what they're short of. So uh, we're working with them. We're doing the same thing in the Baltimore, I mean, the Washington metropolitan area to, tr to try to set up um, um, uh, alternative facilities to ease overcrowding in hospitals. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I think we have a question from Senator Rosa Pep. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. I mean, Secretary, I just want to follow up on Josh, uh, Tom's and Josh's presentations about the numbers related to testing, tracing, and quarantining that we need the data to make decisions. Do you guys have a model of where we are in terms of access to each of those three capacities to, to have the metrics to kind of figure out when we can judge, when we can loosen up? Um, the commercial labs are accelerating their volumes, uh, Senator Rosa Pep, and I just um, um, uh, made an agreement with um, the University of Maryland Medical School they have a, uh, we're, we're helping them stand up a testing uh, a facility that will have the capacity of 20,000 tests a day. And that will get us into the ball game um, for uh, widespread testing and uh, strategic testing uh, to, to be able to better handle this. All right. Okay, I think uh, Delegate Kipke is next. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Secretary, in regards to the discussions about you know, surge, um, what I'm hearing from certain hospitals is that they don't know how, uh, what the process is for supplies, ventilators, masks, face shields, et cetera, that the state is acquiring. They don't know what the process is for receiving those items as the surge takes place. So is there a system in place and can you let us know what that is? Thank you. Thank you. The, um, a lot of the protective equipment um, goes through the local health officer. We're setting up, because of the crucial nature of it, we're setting up a special process for ventilators so that we can, um, we can um, uh, move them around and get them into place as, as quickly as possible. But most of the materials, we're trying to get the local uh, government, the local emergency manager, the local health officer, and the local hospitals to get together 
and um, develop a good working relationship so that we can get this stuff uh, distributed. So that those are the two things: um, the uh, the stream for materials and um, equipment and protective equipment, and then uh, the um, and then the, the ventilator process, which we're probably going to run through the emergency medical system. So that'll be the contact point there. But we're hoping to have enough ventilators in everyone's hands uh, when the time comes, so that we won't be uh, we won't be getting panic calls about the shortage of ventilators. All right, next up, we have uh, Speaker Pro Tem Sample Hughes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. I wanted to um, just ask you in regards to the nursing homes. Are you seeing that uh, widespread across the state, or is it one concentrated area? Um, because I don't know if you've issued a listing or anything, but um, I was curious about that, and what's the timeline for you to have the um, proper equipment that is necessary for these specific nursing homes. And the last statement I just wanted to make is that um, just before I jumped on the call this morning, I had a request from the Maryland Food Bank. And I don't know if this is across the state, but I know here on the Eastern Shore that they're in need of masks um, and supplies as well, because there's been an increase for the number of persons wanting and needing food. So those are my points, the nursing homes and the food bank. Let me take the food bank one first, Delegate, if I may. Um, the Department of Human Services has the lead on that. The, um, uh, they're, they're suffering a real crunch because uh, the demand has gone up and many of the people that they depended on for contributions has gone down. So we're going to have to take some extraordinary measures to replenish the food banks and, and, and keep people afloat. And that work is, is, is underway. The nursing homes, we have 230 nursing homes in the state. Um, uh, as I speak, over 90 have an outbreak of some sort. Now, that could be a staff person, a patient, a staff person, and a patient. Um, but the reason the governor issued the order on Sunday is that these are our most vulnerable populations. They can't go anywhere. So if the virus uh, takes up residence in a nursing home, you've got a, you've got a real problem. So we set up these strike forces, and uh, we're, we're doing two things. We're helping the nursing homes that are enduring a, um, an outbreak to move people around, distance them, and whatnot. A lot, of these, a lot of these people are doctors, nurses, and also members of the National Guard. Um, in the ones that have not been um, impacted yet, we're trying to help them uh, prevent uh, from getting impacted. So uh, if you add up all of the outbreaks that we've had, it accounts for about 600, give or take, of the cases that we have statewide. So it's about, you know, 10 or 12 percent of, um, of the overall cases we have. It's not an insignificant number. And of course, they're, they're very vulnerable people. We are also, um, uh, we've accelerated our issuance of protective material so the staff is protected and the residents are protected from the staff. So that's, uh, that's what's happening. And that's a uh, very recent vintage. It, that started Sunday. Okay. Uh, Delegate Pena Melnick. So much for your presentation and for um, Mr. Secretary answering, you know, all the emails they were sending you offline. I have a couple of points and good morning, everyone. One is, as you consider the measures that you're going to take regarding the food banks, if you can also include in that discussion, the nonprofits that definitely are um, helping the most vulnerable in our community as we look at the money that uh, we're getting from the federal government um, to make sure that they're adequately funded. The other um, issue that I have is we're getting a lot of emails in our offices regarding the state employees and the lack of personal protective equipment, especially Springfield Hospital Center and a lot of the prisons. So can we make sure please that they have what they need so they can be protected? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the, uh, the, the nonprofits um, 
uh, we're working on that. It's actually a double whammy because in many cases, the Maryland Food Bank or the, the, the D.C. area food bank is sort of a wholesaler for a lot of these nonprofits that hand out food. So it, it's a doubly complicated problem. As far as state employees are concerned, um, we, are, we are moving protective equipment out into all of our institutions, and um, I, think, I think that has been done. Uh, but I will double check just to make sure that no one was skipped. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I think we have one final question uh, for you from Senator Hershey, and we also appreciate ahead of time the, the responses to those other questions. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Secretary. And uh, this might be for you or Dr. Inglesby as well, too. But um, both of you mentioned the testing that was going on. And um, I understand or at least have heard that there is a shortage of test kits. Um, however, if I, I look at yesterday's numbers, because that's all I've seen yesterday, uh, so far, is that we've uh, tested over 31,000 individuals yet only have uh, just over 4,000 positive test results, or about 13%. Yet I understand that the people being tested are the ones that um, have gotten a doctor's referral or, or at least showing symptoms of COVID-19, meaning they have the cough, the fever, shortness of breath. So kind of just have two questions. Um, why are we seeing such a low positive result rate tests at 13%. And if that is considered low, um, should we be changing the criteria on how the referrals are prescribed or who actually qualifies for these types of tests? Thanks. Um, Senator Hershey, I do think that number is a little low, but it, is, it has been, it started out lower than that and it's gradually been increasing. Bear in mind that we're using a very narrow um, gauge on uh, the criteria for this testing. I think in order to get to where um, um, uh, the experts say we need to be, we, we need to uh, test uh, a much larger portion of our population, whether symptomatic or not, in order to get a complete picture. It's, it's my hope that when the, the University of Maryland stands up their lab and these other labs continue to gain uh, velocity, uh, we'll be in a position to do that, and we'll get a much clearer picture, not just during the the heightened area of this pandemic, but more importantly, when things start to wane and we start to look about how we can open up again, that information is going to be crucial. Mr. Secretary, I want to uh, jump in there. I know that um, uh, Dr. Sharfstein and Inglesby have, may have an answer there, but I know that your time is 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 short. So I just want to thank you for presenting uh, today, and we will certainly stay in touch and appreciate the ongoing work and, and uh, look forward to getting the, the follow-up questions, uh, but keep us posted as we can move forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Speaker. And then uh, doctors uh, Inglesby and, and Sharstein, I, I have one quick question that is related to the last one before we move to the superintendent of schools. Uh, I think all of us are getting the same question over and over of when will it end, and I think both of you, you really... Uh, try to tackle that with as much uncertainty as we know exists. Um, you know, I think I've become more and more convinced that it's the testing, the, the tracing and the quarantining that the sort of secondary parts. And I thought that graph, Dr. Sharfstein, that you showed was really incredibly helpful for seeing kind of the dial up and dial down. Are there any states who have been models or countries uh, that have created sort of performance dashboards for the tracing and quarantining capacities? I mean, well, I guess all three, but so that we can know whether or not we've built the systems to, to start to reduce the social distancing, but it's hard to know whether we have it in place right now because I haven't necessarily seen a performance dashboard on the back end side. Maybe I'll jump in that Tom have the last word if that's okay, Tom. Sure, just, sure. Just, just to say that on, on your point, um, I think we're gonna have to build up that muscle of isolation, contact tracing, quarantine that we don't really have. Um, I recently interviewed for our podcast, uh, Tolbert Nienswa, who was the lead uh, public health person responsible for the control of the Ebola virus in Liberia. And I talked to him about this and he said, they didn't just measure deaths. They didn't just measure hospitalizations. They didn't just measure, measure cases. They measured 
how many people um, were identified and successfully isolated, how many contacts were identified and the percentage of contacts that were successfully quarantined. And so he had a visibility and they did this in Liberia with thousands of people that they had to hire um, uh, or volunteers fanning out all across the country. He said places where people didn't have a fixed address, certainly no cell phones, um, but they were able to do that. And he was able to look and see here's where we are, not just with the number of cases, but with all of these different public health strategies in full effect, are they being successful? What parts of the country is he seeing that they're having trouble with you know, finding contacts? And so he had a really good sense of the ability that his public health system had to shut down the infections. And in the end, they, they shut down the Ebola transmission well in advance of the big hospitals being built. So that when the big hospitals were built, there were only a couple patients there. So um, for some, that's gonna be hard with this virus because this virus is more contagious in some ways than Ebola. But um, that's the concept that there will be other measures though. And, and we're gonna have to really build up uh, a much stronger response capacity. Thank you. Dr. Inglesby, did you wanna add in? Yeah, I um, certainly agree with what Josh said. And I, I would say that um, in China, they had thousands of contact tracers working to try and do this work in Wuhan. In Singapore, something on the order of 500 contact tracers for a, a country that's about the size of Maryland, you know, give or take, they have about 5 million people, but they have a very, very organized, um, very well-resourced public health system. So just in terms of order of magnitude, you know, that's, that's kind of in thinking about how many contact tracers we might need in the state over this coming year or two, 500, 1,000, 2,000, I don't think we've, it's been worked out yet, but it, we don't have that in place. Uh, <clears throat> I think Singapore also has a dashboard for the kinds of things that you're looking at. They know exactly patient number 82. This is where this patient 82 is. These are the contacts of patient 82. We are so overwhelmed at this point around the country that we can't do that, but we do need to drive to a point where we can have dashboards like you're talking about, where we know where all of our COVID patients are in Maryland at a given time, where their contacts are, how they're doing, are they recovering, kind of moving through the system, but we don't have that yet. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, and I know Senator Lamb, I will follow or if I, I know Senator Lamb has a question, but I, I know we also have the superintendent of schools on the line and she has been, she jumped off another call. So just want to say thank you both uh, Dr. Sharfstein, and Dr. Inglesby for your work and, and your ongoing partnership and how willing you all have been to help answer questions. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your presentation today. We may follow up with some written questions if you wouldn't mind. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, Mr. President, and all, uh, all of you, you for having us. Thanks very thank much. You. All right, I believe we have uh, Dr. Salmon on the line, is that? Good morning, good morning, uh, Mr. President and Madam Speaker. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update to your advisory board. Uh, would you like me to proceed with the general update and then folks can ask questions? That'd be great. That'd be great. All right, well, you know, it's, uh, it seems like months since uh, the governor declared a state of emergency. We, we kind of joke that every day is like a month, um, but we have, uh, the State Department um, has been really prioritizing um, uh, the uh, essential health and, and issues of our children. And that's why we started with our meal delivery system that normally occurs in the summer. So immediately after the announcement was made that we were closing school, we put together our meal program, applied for the federal waivers for reimbursement, and now we are serving um, over um, three meals and a snack every day at 600 plus sites. Um, we have um, served about uh, 2.5 million meals since this began, and uh, that's going really well, and uh, people are really appreciative of it. Uh, at this point, our food service workers should really be uh, held in high esteem. Uh, they have not asked for any help, although the National Guard is ready to help in, in, in any case that we need it, but they've done a great job, and we're really proud of their work. The other thing that we stood up immediately was looking to make sure we had enough child care for essential personnel. And right now we have um, 20,000 children uh, enrolled at uh, about 3,600 child care sites across the state. And we also have the capacity to increase that another 20,000 slots. 
So uh, we're ready if there is indeed another um, need or surge of, of people needing uh, child care. The other thing we jumped in to do was working with our local school systems on how they were going to develop their plans for continuity of learning for students during the period of school closures. And uh, we have had a call, or I've had a call with uh, superintendents over the past three and a half weeks um, every other day. And we talk about their concerns, questions. Um, we talk about uh, things that we can share with them. And we created a drop box where superintendents can put their best thinking of uh, plans. Uh, also, we have resources there uh, with all the links that, that folks can um, click on. We're working with Maryland Public Television, who is doing a great job of putting out um, lessons uh, uh, daily. And many of our cable stations across the state are working with local school systems to push out learning. The other thing that school systems have been doing um, is uh, where they uh, did not have a one-to-one -one device. They are purchasing additional uh, devices for their students and then um, handing them out along with the food delivery. Um, uh, we are anticipating, as you know about the CARES Act, of getting additional funding and uh, being allowed to have waivers for our title funding for this uh, coming year where systems can really look at what their needs are during this distance learning period and make sure they can shore up uh, in the areas um, uh, where they need to. Um, we have been really um, vetting and, and checking all the online resources that um, uh, systems are using to make sure that they're meeting with our standards and our uh, content people at the State Department have put out documents to the school systems, uh, which have all the standards that we anticipate need to be covered between now, uh, between when school was closed and the end of the school year. Um, I've had, uh, we've had uh, one board meeting with the state board. We will be having another one uh, next Tuesday and another one on the 28th of April to consider uh, waivers from the federal government in terms of the funding waivers. Uh, we already got the waiver for uh, federal testing. We will be not be doing any federal testing. We have a lot of waivers to consider in terms of for our seniors because we fully anticipate that our seniors will graduate with this uh, they've done three quarters of the year and this extra time for the continuity of learning and if and when we go back to school, um, they will have credit and they will move on to their next phase of post-secondary. And again, all of our students will move on to the next grade. We have already determined that. Um, we are continually trying to um, make sure that we're answering questions from the public about their concerns. And as you can imagine, we are getting massive amounts of uh, emails, uh, predominantly emails uh, daily, and we're trying to keep up with the volume of getting back to our constituents and our parents um, to make them feel that they have a stake in this and that we're supporting them as well as we're supporting our school system. Um, so again, we are uh, trying to do things at a very rapid pace, uh, uh, engaging the state board as much as possible um, through our uh, phone conferences. And um, so we have a lot of work still left to do. Most of our staff at MSBE um, is working pretty much 24 seven and uh, we're getting a lot done, but there's still a lot of work to do. So I'm sure I didn't cover everyone's questions, but I'd be, I thought it would be good to have more of a dialogue than me talking. So I'm going to stop for questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Madam Superintendent. Uh, our first question is Senator Pinsky. Um, let's see if we can make sure that Senator Pinsky is unmuted. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. There we go. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Secretary, Clearly, you have a lot of difficult challenges in the immediate time, uh, opening or closing, distance learning, graduation requirements. Um, but after June 15th, a big question remains, and that is how do we make up the lost quarter of learning or possibly a semester of learning, given the learning loss that happens over the summer, when you add on the extra two or three months, that could be four or five months of learning loss. So we actually could have almost a half years of le true learning lost. And I know you received my letter, and I guess my question is, um, have you thought about 
or are you willing to begin a discussion about year-round learning? Um, if there's any time to start looking at this, uh, given this loss and having uh, this coming summer and the following summer, it seems like an ideal time to begin to have a conversation with local superintendents, local boards of education of considering um, using year round schools, either for the short term or maybe even longer. So, uh, you know, while it's a complicated issue, it takes time to roll out. I do think it's an appropriate time to begin that conversation with other uh, education thought leaders. So I guess I, I'm interested to see whether you would engage in that conversation or maybe even lead that conversation, uh, given the current situation uh, regarding year round schooling. Well, thank you for that question, um, Senator Pinsky, and I did receive your letter. And um, I think that we can always certainly entertain conversations about going forward, but I would even like to take it further. And that is, I'm not sure that we are going to be doing school in the same way going forward. And I think this period of time, which we will be counting for learning and accountability, uh, these days will count. Um, I think we have school systems, um, I would say the majority of the school systems are able to do a very good job of distance learning. And the ones that aren't able to do it as well are learning and we are getting better at it and we are putting more of our resources from the state to those school systems. Again, I'm not saying we don't need to have that discussion, but I do think we're going to see and be able to see some accountability wrapped around how we do learning and what we will do in the future for learning. Because as I'm sure, and I wasn't on the call earlier, I was on the call with the governor. I'm sure that um, your conversation with our uh, great expert um, epidemiologist, um, we're not sure that this is going to be something that we're not going to revisit um, in the fall or in the winter. So I am really focusing much of our resources on the expansion and the accountability wrapped around online learning and distance learning. So that's gonna be our focus right now because it has to be, because we want our kids to be engaged and um, we want our parents to know that we're doing our very best to respond to learning needs and we don't want those huge learning losses. But again, it's not something I'm saying we're not gonna engage in, but right now we're focused on the distance learning piece. Thanks for that question. Uh, Delegate McIntosh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker and uh, Mr. President. And actually, uh, thank you, Dr. Salmon. You just walked into my question, uh, which is distance learning. Uh, I want to thank you for the work you've been doing. I hear it firsthand through our school system here, how hands-on and how helpful you and your staff have been with our local school system. But uh, you and I know and everybody on this call knows that there is a digital divide in this country. And that divide is once again, uh, I think impacting our students who are most at risk in the state. Uh, and those are students who live uh, in communities of poverty, uh, communities where there is not internet or even computers in the home. And then also our special education population which uh, I think it's, uh, I know it's been a challenge uh, locally and across the state about uh, how to actually um, continue their learning. So uh, my question is, are you giving uh, local school districts any guidance on how they're gonna be spending the money that came directly to LEAs from the Federal CARE Act that's one. And two, uh, I believe the state got a portion of that money uh, directed to, uh, or will get a portion of that money directed to your uh, offices. And how are you going to use that? And will the focus, in fact, be, as you just stated, trying to close this digital divide, at least within our school systems? Well, thank you, Delegate. Um, that is my passion and has been uh, when I started the one-to-one -one initiative in Talbot County back in 2005 and everyone laughed at me thinking I was crazy. Um, now Talbot County has laptops and devices for all of their children pre-K through grade 12 and many systems followed suit finally. 
but we haven't done enough in many systems to promote um, the, uh, the expansion of the devices. And I believe that has to be our focus. And in fact, I had a conversation with my board leadership yesterday, and I said, this is where I'm going to repurpose pins in the department. I'm going to put more people towards uh, the facilitation of online learning to the development of uh, programs and courses. Um, we have to ramp this up because this is the 21st century. And um, I am also proud to say back on your question about even internet access, we've had uh, local school systems do some really creative things during this time. One, uh, uh, they're putting school buses with huge hotspots on them and parking them in the parking lot so that cars can come around them. They're putting um, hotspots on fire companies in the community so that that can also help people have access. And they're also buying devices called Kajiks that are able to be a hotspot for people that do not have Internet. So we're really trying to push out this. And I agree. Uh, I believe any money we get uh, from the CARES Act that goes to the locals that do not have these facilities for online learning and distance learning, they need to be prioritized. And that will certainly be my recommendation. And any state money we get, I'm going to do the same thing with that as well, because we have got to get to the point where we're better at delivering education online, because I believe it is the wave of the future. But thank you for that question. And um, thank you for your nice comments. Delegate Lukey. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Mr. President. Um, Madam Superintendent, you mentioned waivers earlier, and I want to ask about uh, waivers in terms of uh, the certification and evaluation processes that would normally be ongoing right now. Um, in terms of certification, it was my understanding that there was a, a, a sort of 30-day waiver that was built into one of the executive orders, um, but we have a lot of student teachers who are supposed to be graduating from universities um, and who are unable to do things like take praxis tests and, and meet those requirements. I know a number of states have implemented one-year waivers to allow those teachers to be hired provisionally under a provisional certification and finish their requirements when uh, the lockdown ends. Um, so is that under consideration? Also, um, is there consideration being given to easing requirements for evaluations given that um, teachers are, are now teaching in completely different circumstances than what they were uh, trained for. Um, and it's difficult uh, just from a logistical perspective for in-person uh, observations to occur. Yeah, those are all great questions, um, Delegate Lukey. And those are all things that obviously we are working on right now and have come to some conclusions about many of those things. And we'll be presenting those to the board um, in the upcoming two meetings for their uh, approval. <clears throat> you mentioned the... Um, the issue with our teacher um, candidates. And yes, we, we um, worked with higher ed almost three and a half weeks ago to come up with some plans for those students to be able to be engaged in some kind of learning, uh, whether it was, we, I, we came up with four different options. Uh, one was that they could continue to work with their uh, affiliate school to provide the distance learning, uh, work with that classroom teacher in, in their uh, activities that they were doing. Another was they could uh, start working with the State Department to develop online lessons that we could push out to the systems that didn't have as many um, lessons ready. And uh, they could also uh, volunteer to work in some of the child care settings with the essential uh, personnel um, that we uh, popped up for, for those folks. And the other thing was they could come up with some very creative project that we would have then approve and through the university and through us. We want to be able to start out right, right in, in the beginning of the school year to hire these people or this summer or whenever we can hire them. Some, some have a contract already. And so we don't want to impede that process at all. So we tried to come up with some very um, innovative ways for them to meet their hours. And we also know that most of them and most of our programs do much more than 100 days. They, they've had a lot of experience in that first three quarters. So we felt pretty comfortable in doing that. In terms of the uh, evaluation and um, monitoring of our teachers, absolutely, we have to be more creative. Again, um, you know, we're going to try to look at giving um, more days before people have to make those kinds of decisions. 
Um, and we're also, um, you know, saying to folks, monitor your folks, um, you know, during this continuity of learning period. But, you know, three quarters of the year, I'm sure that most people had uh, at least one or two of their observations, and they certainly could give feedback to the teachers based on that. We just have to be realistic. We have to be consistent, but we also have to be flexible during this time. Okay. Um Delegate McIntosh, your hand is still raised. Do you have another question? I, I'm sorry, Madam Speaker. I oh. did have one more question real quick. Okay. Uh, okay. What's the, um, can you talk a little bit about how we are uh, working with homeless uh, children or children that are homeless around the state vis-a-vis -vis their learning, uh, getting them their learning packets or getting them connected? Yes, and that was a huge worry for all of us. Um, you know, that was like the first thing that we were thinking about is, oh my goodness, uh, our school systems are really, um, you know, we do have folks at our State Department that work with that, those programs. They are also working with our school systems. And I forgot to mention that every local superintendent has a point of contact at the State Department. Uh, it's one of my assistant state superintendents or an executive director that they can call night or day and that person can give them immediate assistance. So we are um, trying to ramp up and making sure that we are, uh, meals are, are being delivered uh, to those folks. Most of the school systems know where they are being housed at this point in time, and they are being very diligent about getting them the materials that they need, um, because we all know that this is such a vulnerable population, and um, they are certainly in, um, you know, in the loop for what they are, are, what they need and what we're trying to get them. Thank you for that question. I should have mentioned it earlier. Uh, thank you, Madam Superintendent. I think that that does all the questions. I have a, just a couple small, um, if you could just give sort of a general sense, uh, and it's, it's three things, but they're sort of quick. Um, I know that certain districts have asked about the timeline for waiver decisions, and I'm wondering if you have a timeline for that, um, a timeline for making a decision about whether there are additional days beyond what's already been noted um, when school would be remote. Um, and then finally, whether or not we uh, have a sense of the graduation requirements and a timeline for deciding graduation decision points. Those are all really great questions. I'm gonna start with the last one in case I forgot the first two and then uh -huh. you can remind me. Um, but um, we are gonna be trying to wrap up those by the end of April with the next two board meetings, the 14th and the 28th. We, we are bringing to the board the consideration of, of waiving the high school assessments for any students that haven't taken them as seniors, which are a very, very small number, by the way. Um, we're looking at waiving service learning requirements. And again, it's a very small number of students by, by the time they're seniors that don't have all their hours. Um, so we're definitely going to try to have that um, completed because we don't want families angsting about this. They have enough to worry about right now. So we want to make sure folks know that we're uh, going to be making these uh, uh, waivers uh, hopefully finalized by the end of April. End of April. Um, in terms of um, the, the timeline, of, you know, uh, that's the question we get the most. And you, you said it earlier, I was listening, you know, when is this gonna end? Um, you know, we, we have those calls. You just heard from um, some of the, the doctors that the governor talks to, and I'm on those calls also um, twice a week. We really take our direction from them and, and what they're seeing in terms of the modeling. Um, and then we'll, you know, that's how we made the decision about closing for four weeks. Uh, we didn't want to um, just throw up our hands at this point um, because we wanted to see what was going to happen with our, our interventions with social distancing. So I think we're still going to be looking at their advice. And then, um, you know, I'll also be talking to the state board. And then I would think that um, we're going to have to make a decision um, certainly well before the 24th so that folks know what's coming ahead. And I might've missed one question. So if you'll remind me, I'd be happy to answer it. Uh, there was a, so, uh, so superintendents have requested um, some waivers on specific things and whether or not that's, is it a case by case basis or, or are you trying? Each oh, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I'd like, for example, we've had some superintendents ask us for waivers 
of the uh, uh, the uh, spring holiday. Uh, and so those will be coming to the board and obviously they'll be approved. Um, we will entertain uh, waivers as they come in. There's not going to be any timelines to that. Um, so, and, and I have the power to do some uh, forward um, uh, approval of some of those waivers and then the board can, can come back and retroactively approve them. So I think they're, we're really trying to be flexible on the timelines as well. Great. Madam Speaker, unless or do you have any final questions? Mm, no, because I know how to get a hold of her. <laughs> Deal. Excellent. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Superintendent. We appreciate the work that you're doing and uh, look forward to the ongoing partnership. Did we lose the superintendent? Well, we'll just keep... <laughs> hopefully she heard us in abstentia uh, that uh, uh, we appreciate her joining us today. Um, so we have our... Um, just some, some final concluding uh, remarks, but we wanted to just give a moment um, if there are members who wanted to flag issues very briefly of things that, um, you know, we've gotten a lot of great presentations. Um, if there are any kind of concluding comments uh, that individuals want to, to flag uh, before, we, before we close down today, we're a little bit over time, but uh, we just want to leave a couple minutes. Um, Looks like we have uh, Senator Smith. Sure, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. So I, I know we have, um, we've had a lot of presentations on various issues, but I, I wonder if we could focus on housing and some of the housing relief, rental relief specifically in coming presentations. I've submitted some questions um, with respect to rental assistance and relief, but uh, you know, focus on that and then some small business relief and. Uh, kind of sifting through the CARES Act. Um, that would be two issues that I'd be interested in having some folks come in on in the future. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Delegate Penya Melnick. Thank you. I just want to um, bring up the issue that, and I'm sure a lot of you have been getting emails, the unemployment division um, it is really difficult for people to get through. I got an emails of people that have been trying for three weeks. Um, and I know there's some other states like Florida are using some of the money that are coming from the federal government to be able to hire people for the call center. So if we can put some pressure on that, because I know a lot of you are getting those emails as well. And then finally, as we move forward, I didn't ask the question of the secretary, but I will offline, is having some type of homework hotline for um, you know, the different counties people can reach and, um, and be able to help their kids do their homework um, as we think about how we're gonna spend some of the money. I think that's a good investment. Thank you. Delegate McIntyre. Thank you. Um, I just want to flag something that I think the speaker pro tem raised earlier um, for this group, and that is that I understand that the Maryland Food Bank next week will be in dire straits for food uh, distribution. So I think it's something uh, that maybe we collectively uh, need to make sure that uh, the state and our local uh, uh, county offices are helping um, to get uh, more resources into that Maryland Food Bank. That's one. And two, um, the Appropriations Committee is going to be doing a briefing on the Federal CARES Act uh, Thursday at two o'clock um, on a, in a format like this, and it will be uploaded. So uh, just so you know that, you can go and click on that link and um, uh, we are actually going to have uh, a walkthrough of that act. Thank you. Uh, Senator Griffith. Do we have Senator Griffith? Oh, maybe not. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Yes. There we go. Um, just briefly, I wanted to uh, kind of follow up on a comment that President Ferguson made in uh, conversations I've had with Senator Rosapath. 
Uh, in thinking about the recovery efforts, I, we all got an email yesterday that uh, some funds that were being offered through uh, Secretary Schultz's office and I think through Department of Labor have stopped uh, being available for uh, businesses to apply for. And one, I, I would like us to explore whether or not we think those funding opportunities might be reopened. And then two, I'm certainly interested in uh, the conversations about business recovery as we move through the next phase of this process. So I hope that we can have uh, moving forward some conversations about that. Thank you, Senator. Um, I, I believe we have Senator Kelly on the call. She wanted to raise an issue as well. Senator Kelly, are you able to Nope. Okay, we'll circle back. Um, Senator Smith, did you have did we have something else? If we could unmute there, Senator Smith. Okay, hey, there you go. Thanks. Uh, just a parenthetical uh, kind of comment. I know that this is, I want to say thank you to the group and Mr. President and Madam Speaker, just because this information is great. We can go back and disseminate it to our, our, our various constituencies, but one other thing, this would be a great uh, forum to pack together a set of recommendations that we can uh, forward along to the administration. And I wondered if we could just, maybe we can start talking about some of those. I know that I've been putting together some one pages of questions and we've all been doing that uh, in our individual capacities, but maybe as a group, since we have, we've been hearing from folks in our jurisdictions, we could put together maybe a couple of recommendations moving forward for the administration. Just, just a parenthetical comment. It seems like a great forum for that. So for what it's right. Thank you. Well, I think that's, that's everyone, Madam Speaker, mm -hmm. um, and appreciate the comments as well. Yeah, good comment, good question. Um, we're meeting same time next week. Next April 15th. April 15th. 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. Great, wonderful. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, everybody.